Good evening, my friends. Come on in. Have a drink, a bite to eat, and pull up a chair. Settle in now, for tonight I have quite the story to tell. Are you ready? Good. Then let us begin. Last time, I brought you all an anecdote from my childhood, when overhype about kidnappings caused little me to be a little bit lackadaisical in my perception of my surroundings. Well, that story got me to thinking. Between that and one of the horror-slash-true-crime groups that I frequent on Facebook, I was inspired to create tonight's short story. Now, please join me. Or a tale of a serial killer, his madness, and the women who wrote to him. I give you Golden Child. Nathaniel Martin was innocent, or so he claimed. All of us here on death row are innocent, he thought aloud as he scrawled the very same words across the sheet of paper a stern-faced guard looking down at him through the bars. Of course, like the rest of the inmates Nathaniel met on death row, that was a lie. They were all guilty, each and every one. They knew what they did. Some, like himself, relished in their work. You see, Nathaniel was what they called a serial killer. The cops had only found five. Or, well, what was left of them. Nathaniel remembered them with disgust. He never learned most of their names until the media released them. But he remembered their faces well. Sarah, age six, his first victim. She reminded him so, so much of his older stepsister. The one that had done so many horrible things to him all those years ago. He remembered her long, blonde hair, while she always had it pulled back into a ponytail. She took such good care of her hair, brushing it until it shined. She had preferred it long, saying how it made her look like a princess. <laughs> that bitch. She was the princess of the family, all right. Her first decree? Getting Nathaniel exiled from his own home. So, when Nathaniel caught the glimpse of sunshine and Sarah's tiny head bobbed up and down as she rode over the potholes on what he knew was a normally abandoned path, he snapped. The next thing he knew, she was dead at his feet, her bicycle discarded nearby. The sight of the crumpled girl upon the dusty trail felt like a hunger he didn't even know he had had been sated. Instead of guilt at what he had done, there was elation. For a little while. Oh, he knew he couldn't just leave a dead kid out in the middle of nowhere to find, especially not with his fingerprints on her. So he just took her. Took her to his car grabbed the trash bag he had lying around he had tossed in the back seat with intent to clean up the old beer cans lying in the floorboard, stuffed her body in, and drove back up into the mountains. Since there were so many cabins up there that people wintered throughout the summer, he figured that, even if somebody did find her body, it would be hard to track it back to him. Nathaniel swiped the shovel from the tool shed where he kept his groundskeeping equipment, and half drove, half carried Sarah into a deeper part of the woods, and buried her. That night, he slept without dreams. In the coming days, as word of a missing girl spread around the area, his thoughts drifted back to little Sarah. The more he thought about her, however, the more his satisfaction diminished. Her nose was all wrong. Sarah had an almost bird-like nose, whereas that wicked girl had this cute button nose. The shade of gold in her hair was too warm, too. 
The image left him feeling cold, empty. Even as he made a show to help with the search party, the thought of finding Sarah's corpse, the wrong corpse, and seeing it again made him sick. They didn't find her then, but for the year leading up to her discovery, Nathaniel was taunted by his growing hunger. His second victim, Laurie, aged five and a half as she so proudly proclaimed, he took from a park. The little brat was never supposed to have been outside. Apparently, she hadn't gotten to go play at the park that day because her parents had been too busy. And when she had thrown a temper tantrum, she had been banished to her room. Instead of moping the rest of the evening, she decided that she would just take herself to the park. She crawled out of her window and marched the full mile to the playground. By the time she reached it, it was late evening and deserted. Or so she thought. By that point, the hunger for revenge had grown so great in Nathaniel that every little glimmer of blonde, every similarly pitched laugh of a girl child made his head turn. It had begun to drive him mad, and he often spent his evenings wandering to distract himself from the terrible plague that had beset his mind. Nathaniel wasn't really surprised when he came across the little playground. He had actually plopped himself down on a swing when little Laurie showed up. Ugh, that kid. Chatty, just like his stepsister. She didn't shut up the moment she saw him. Practically told him her whole life story and just kept prattling on and on like every word she said was worth its weight in gold. Gold. Just like her hair. Nathaniel found himself tuning out Laurie's babbling and found himself eyeballing the features of her hair and face. Yes, the same shade of gold in her hair. A much, much smaller nose. He could feel the bloodlust rising, his heart pounding in his ears. Then, with only the scarcest remainder of his wits about him, he turned to little Laurie and asked her, Didn't your mother ever tell you not to talk to strangers? He didn't remember if she screamed. Didn't remember the walk home. He had only vague memories of gathering her up into another trash bag and driving her off into the mountains. It had been four months since his first killing, and the hunt had long since been called off for the girl. But even if it hadn't, Nathaniel had spent so long camping out in those woods after his parents kicked him out that he could easily have avoided being spotted, even if he had been carrying a fully grown human around with him. He deposited Laurie amidst the copse of hazelnut and elm trees about twenty miles from his other victim. But she wasn't right either. No, despite her hair and nose being right, her eyes were far too dark. His stepsister had blue eyes, not chocolate brown. The hunger returned far quicker this time, reaching its peak in a matter of weeks. It caused Nathaniel to become distracted at work, causing his performance as a part-time hardware store worker to suffer. In addition, his wanderings began to take him farther and farther from home, physically wearing him out and causing his other job as janitor and groundskeeper for the marina and cabins near where he swiped Sarah to become almost too much for him. Finally, he took to late-night drives throughout the countryside. Eventually, this brought him his third victim, the runaway Cynthia. Another death. Another trip to the mountains. In all honesty, Nathaniel truly thought Cynthia's death would have been the one that got him caught. After all, she hadn't been alone. In fact, she hadn't even been the one he had targeted. Instead, he had been aiming for the girl with her. A girl that, in his headlights, looked just like his stepsister when he had first met her. Sunshiny, shimmering hair pulled back into a ponytail. Cute button nose. Pristinely pale skin. 
big blue eyes. She was perfect. He slammed on the brakes, scaring both girls from the intense squalling of the tires. By the time he got his vehicle turned around, a beautiful, evil girl was cowering behind her friend, the ill-fated Cynthia. When he got out of his car, he began shouting things at them. Things like, I can't believe I finally found you, and your parents have been looking all over for you girls. None of it made much sense, and an adult could have seen right through the crap he was spewing. But kids often listened if an adult sounded loud and angry enough. It had been enough to startle the girls into a moment of thinking, allowing him to close the distance between his car and them. Unfortunately, that wicked blonde girl turned and fled into the woods. Nathaniel turned to follow her, but his ignoring Cynthia broke the spell on the other girl. She pawed at him, yelling who knows what, trying to drag him back. He shoved her back, but it didn't do much good. Cynthia was enough to hinder his steps, letting the blonde girl get away from him. Farther and farther and farther. When he felt her yank on his arm, he dropped his pathetic attempt at a helpful persona and fell upon Cynthia. She would be his most despised victim, and the one he despised himself the most for. Cynthia shouldn't have died. No, where taking down the other satisfied his craving to rid the world, all incarnations of his stepsister. For, after seeing prison counselor after prison counselor, he finally realized that that, indeed, had been the impetus behind his vicious bloodlust. Cynthia had just gotten in the way. She wasn't a monster. No, just a little girl. Far too skinny for her already tiny frame, with sun-dappled skin from playing soccer and swimming on warm summer days, the way other normal little girls did. As he lifted her corpse to toss into the pit he had dug, her freckles, as dark as her hair, stood out like flecks of blood in the glow of the car's headlights. He had murdered a child that night while the real monster was still out there, hiding somewhere in the woods. Nathaniel went home and cried that night, almost wishing the cops would find him after the crime he had committed. But whether he was more turned up about letting the blonde witch escape, and thus allowing another monster to roam free, or his true crime, he wasn't certain. Still, no angry pounding came at his door that night, and even during the trial later, he would never see the one who got away again. Cynthia's remains were never discovered, and he kept her death a dark secret in his heart. Unfortunately, unlike the tiny golden monsters he destroyed, the only real child who had met death at his hands had no family crying for her. No vigil from hopeful friends awaiting to hear of her safe return. The only reason he even knew of her name was because her foster home had reported her missing, and it had been televised that they suspected her drug addict mother had taken her. Since they found the mother dead of an overdose a few days later in an abandoned house not far from the foster home, everyone suspected she had either murdered Cynthia or dropped her off somewhere. It was with no little irony that the one crime Nathaniel truly felt would have gotten him caught, the only crime he truly felt was unjustified, was the one that he got away with. At least, for a time. His hunger continued, however. Three more bodies he put into the ground, Three more golden wretches snatched from secluded roads and woodlands, trailing behind parks and playgrounds. Eight-year-old Candy. Five-year-old Andrea. Six-year-old Suzanne. With each new corpse, his hunger came on that much quicker. It slowly took over his senses, and he began to find himself staring off at glimpses of anyone with yellow hair. 
That is, when he wasn't spacing out entirely. Memories, long since buried deep, were now unearthed. Her scathing words, devil eyes, vicious smiles, cruel hymns, bitter lies. Anxiety attacks like he hadn't had in years began returning to him, and he withdrew from what little social interaction he had. After trying to escape a particularly persistent customer who couldn't find some sort of nail, seriously, that old bat had probably never used a hammer in her life, his panic hit full on and he lashed out, bawling her out and calling her about every name he could think of. Unfortunately, she just happened to be the wife of a fairly rich patron of the cabin rentals, so one word to his manager, and Nathaniel was out of not one, but both jobs, as well as subsequently banned from the marina. He realized that, during the trial, his coke workers had their suspicions of him when they saw him staring at children who resembled the missing girls more and more. Eventually, the law caught up with Nathaniel. By the time they found the bodies, there wasn't much left of them. Surprisingly, they could find no hair or any other evidence of the girls in his car, save for some unidentified long hairs he knew were from Cynthia, but as no one ever thought to try matching them to the missing girl's dead mother, they were subsequently ignored. Just a stroke of luck on his part. In fact, the only thing they could tie to him was his former job as a groundskeeper and presence in the area when some of the girls went missing. But his graves had been shallow, and the remains finally turned up thanks to a dog showing up with a small girl's shoe in its mouth. If he had known those hikers were going to take their dog with them that day, he might not have tried to go after the little girl who snuck off the play behind the hardware store. Unfortunately, he's claiming to be employed there even after he'd been fired, and that little girl being far more wary of potential stranger danger was what got him brought in as a suspect. Oh, they still had enough evidence to tie him to the crimes. Even without him admitting to the crimes, the psychiatrist they brought in managed to weave his past with his stepsister. More supposed crimes that were her fault, damn it, not his occasional drug abuse, and a life that was little better than a vagrance into his makings of a murderer. Not that they weren't absolutely spot on with many of their deductions, but Nathaniel felt he was doing the world a favor and wasn't about to be stuck behind bars where he could not continue his work, could not sate his hunger for his twisted sense of justice. His lawyer even got them to admit on the stand that Nathaniel had never claimed to have known the girls, and that they were merely piling together circumstantial evidence to bolster their careers in forensic psychology. In the end, Nathaniel was convicted anyway. The strangest part of being on death row is one would think nobody would want anything to do with you. Instead, Nathaniel found himself with a steady stream of letters from curious women on the outside. He expected the ones asking why he had killed those children, as well as the death threats. But apparently, some women found his childhood and subsequent life tragic, believing his accounts over what had transpired with his family over the musings of the psychiatrists. It made him feel good to be believed even if the first people who ever claimed to believe him were strangers, and he was hearing their written thoughts surrounded by the dull greenish-yellow walls of his prison cell. It made him feel that he wasn't a monster. Those letters helped him to believe he had done the right thing. Over time, he began to get an inflated sense of self-righteousness, but he wasn't foolish enough to brag about his exploits to the other inmates. Oh no, his lawyer was working too hard to get him out, and Nathaniel was not about to sabotage his chances of continuing what he now saw as divine work. The letters and photos kept pouring in, 
Oh, dear Lord, those photos. Most of the women that wrote him looked like goddesses. The sort of women that would go on to be trophy wives who lived in gated communities and took yachting ventures during the summer. Those women would have turned their noses up in disgust at him before marching off in the opposite direction before his conviction. Another inmate told Nathaniel it was because he was a hot commodity now, that those sort of women liked playing out fantasies of dallying with dangerous criminals after leading such prim and proper lives. It had bothered Nathaniel somewhat, especially when correspondence dropped off after he steered some of the flirtier conversations toward something more serious. However, one of his writers truly stuck with him during his stay. Her name was Miranda Gruber, and she was a criminal justice student going to a community college near his former killing grounds. Some of her initial questions pertained mostly to the crimes he had committed. But unlike other crime enthusiasts, she tried to talk to him like a normal person. Like a friend. She didn't simply send scandalous notes or focus solely on his previous doings, but she asked him about his hobbies and hopes for when he got out. She seemed to truly believe that he was innocent and that he would get out some day. Oh, sure, he had had some protesters who felt like the cops had just put the blame on a poor, uneducated man initially, but those had mostly dropped off after the testimonies of the psychiatrist and Nathaniel's co-workers. No... Miranda really felt like he was innocent, and even talked of meeting him some day. The only strange thing is she never sent him a real picture of herself. Sure, she sent photos, but they were mostly of other things, things that he told her he missed on the outside. The sunset, the lake at the base of the mountain, the hiking trails. She even once sent him a picture of a beautiful black and blue butterfly sitting in her hand. Oh, he asked her for a photo of herself, but she refused, saying, You'll see me when you get out. I promise. Yes, that was the other thing unique about Miranda. She truly wanted to meet him. Not to study him, but to actually be with him. Over time, Nathaniel felt his demonic craving fade, as a new, unfamiliar feeling began to fill in the void it occupied. It never truly went away, mind you, but the strange starings he felt deep within him whenever he received one of Miranda's letters was enough to quash it down somewhat. He never felt he could entirely be released from his true fate, but sometimes, briefly, he imagined what it would be like to have a life with her in a world where his stepsister and her cruelty had never existed. He really didn't think it would become a reality, though. So he was shocked to hear that he was going back in for a retrial. Apparently, there was some corruption among a couple of the cops that had handled Nathaniel's case, so quite a few procedures had not been followed. Even better, his lawyer told him, there is proof that one of them tampered with evidence in multiple cases and even lied on the stand. With great excitement, Nathaniel wrote Miranda that his days imprisoned would soon be up. Happily, she replied with even more enthusiasm than he had written her, and they began to talk of what he would like to do on his first day out. The days leading up to the retrial seemed to drag on with excruciating slowness, but they finally came. In the end, his case was reviewed, and it was deemed that, while the evidence leaned more toward him, there were several other potential suspects that could have easily been guilty. Of course, some of the public was outraged when he was released, but others were elated for him. His lawyer even began talking about his book deals, television appearances, and a plethora of other things to showcase the awful perversion of justice that he had suffered. But Nathaniel wanted none of that. He just wanted to see Miranda. The day he got out was the first day he ever spoke to her on the phone. He had received her number in the last letter she wrote before his release, but his hands still trembled as he dialed the buttons on the great black phone. Her voice was sweet and welcoming, and slowly took the shakiness out of his own voice, which was raspy from this use. She was sorry she couldn't come to pick him up as she had been in the middle of final exams, but she would be waiting at home that evening. With elation in his heart, Nathaniel caught a ride with his lawyer into town. There, 
and got a haircut, picked up a new suit, and bought a bouquet to bring to his most stalwart supporter. As he passed a jewelry store, he found himself glancing at a few of the diamond-encrusted rings. Perhaps one day, he would be forever catching glimmers of gold, only this time in the form of one of those pretty bands on the finger of his Miranda. He found her home soon enough. It was a small house, just on the outskirts of town, a bit secluded, surrounded by pines and hickory trees, with a few lilies by the porch steps. Cozy and homey, just the slice of domesticity that he had been missing in his life. Nathaniel stepped up on the porch and found the main door open, with the glass storm door providing him a glimpse into the simply decorated hallway. He let himself in, ambling slowly inside, taking in the paintings of various landscapes and sunsets that lined the walls as he headed to the first doorway he saw. He could vaguely hear water running in another room, and he looked at his watch. He was a little early. Maybe she was still in the shower? As he headed through the arch into the next room, he saw a little table set for two, with a letter folded and laid upon the dish in front of him. On it was scrawled Nathaniel, so he picked it up and began reading. His eyes began flitting across the neat, curly handwriting. Dear Nathaniel, I have dearly wanted to meet you in person for years now. I always hoped that one day you would secure your freedom and we would finally see each other face to face. When that day came, I wanted to be sure to give you the welcome that you never had, but always truly deserved. Miranda Nathaniel smiled and refolded the letter. It was then that he noticed something else was on the plate. There was a Polaroid, overturned, with writing on the back. A date. March 15, 1985. He picked it up and turned it over. And his heart suddenly began to race. In the photograph were two young girls. Two very familiar young girls. One with dark hair and freckles, and the other, the beautiful, wicked blonde girl he had saw that night eight years ago. But how? Blood pounding in his ears, time slowed to a halt, and his vision now flecked by dancing blots of darkness, he turned to look behind him. A tall young woman was standing there. A woman with a cute button nose and pristinely pale skin with her long blonde ponytail slung over her shoulder. She was a ghost he had long ago began to wonder if he imagined that night. The night he killed Cynthia. Her brilliant blue eyes were trained on him, as was her revolver. Well, my friends, did you enjoy this story? For Nathaniel, I was going for an unreliable narrator who was slowly beginning to grasp his badness. I smashed a bit of Son of Sam's mentality in with a bit of Charles Manson's grandiose persona, drawing on how popular Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer were in prison because they were so handsome. I don't see it, and I would say to each their own, but bleh. As for Miranda, I couldn't figure out how to properly work it into this short story. But I wanted her to be another girl from the foster home who ran back and kept the secret of her friend's disappearance out of fear. Upon seeing Nathaniel on the news and learning he had targeted young blonde girls due to undisclosed heinous acts regarding a stepsister, 
She would have realized that Cynthia likely only died to protect her, grew up to study criminal justice in order to try to get into Nathaniel's mind, and then convinced him that she loved him to coax him to her home so she could exact her own vengeance as repayment for when she was too cowardly to do anything, in her eyes. Perhaps she, too, had gone mad with grief and whatever else she dealt with, I don't know. There wasn't enough room to truly explore her character. As always, please leave your thoughts on this story in the comments. Also, in all seriousness, have any of you out there listening ever written to a serial killer? I don't mean because you had plans to secretly fatten their brain cells up with love so you could coax them over to your gingerbread house and broil them in the oven. If you have written any, have they ever written back? If you'd like to share with us, please, tell us in the comment below. If you like this video, please share it all over the internet and with your friends. Like this video and subscribe to my channel. Also. Do remember to hit the notification bell so you can catch your next spooky bits the moment it comes out. Good night, and see you all real soon.